Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's Friday, October 20th, 1 p.m. We are in the John Ferraro Council Chambers. This is a Civil Rights, Equity, Immigration, Aging, and Disability Committee. Uh, welcome, everyone. And Mr. Clerk, can you please call the roll? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Council Member Soto Martinez. Here. Council Member Hutt. Here. Council Member Hernandez. Present. Council Member Padilla. Present. And Council Member Rodriguez. Council Member Rodriguez is currently absent, so that's four members and a quorum. Thank you so much. Um, we have uh, somewhat of a light agenda, only seven items today, uh, several report backs. Uh, I will as we do have a, a technical amendment for item two, um, can we read that into the record now, Mr. Clerk? Okay, item number two, the um, revised recommendation would be to um, revise recommendation number one and table two to decrease the total CDBG reprogramming amount by 645000 $321.55 from $22,802,993 to $22,157,639.38 resulting in a new CDGB resources of $23,593,000 $3,230.38 and also to replace attachments 1, 3, and 6 with the revised attachments reflecting these changes. Thank you so much, Mr. Espinosa. Um, as we move into the, the meeting, uh, I will just want to flag for my colleagues that uh, I would like to take item 4, 5, and 7 on consent. Um, does anybody want to pull any of those from the consent? I'd like to pull item four for an amendment. Four, for an amendment. Sorry, my apologies. I'm going to move five, six, and seven on consent. Sorry, my apologies. <coughs> uh, so four, we'll, we'll be hearing. Okay, great. Uh, can we have uh, the city attorney um, read the instructions for a public comment? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> to members of the public, when it is your turn to speak, please state your name and which of the agenda items you would like to speak on. You will have one minute to speak on one agenda item or two minutes to speak on multiple items. In addition, you will have one minute if you wish to speak on general public comment. We will inform you when your time is up. When speaking on the agenda items, you must be on topic. Our goal is to get through as many speakers as we can. If you are not speaking on topic or if we cannot tell whether you are speaking on an agenda item, you will get one brief warning from the city attorney or the chair. If you do not immediately get clearly on topic, or if you stray off topic, you will forfeit the rest of your time, and we will move on to the next speaker. Thank you so much. Uh, and uh, we'll now go into public comment. Uh, for that, uh, Ms. Pinus will be leading us in that. Great. Um, up first, we have um, Goat Puppet, then Mike Greenspan, then John Galt. OK. Can you please read the names one more time? Okay, Folks are here. Um, please come up and speak. Goat Puppet, Mike Greenspan, John Galt. Then we have. Okay, none of those three folks are here, so uh, anybody else? Yeah, we have. Uh, Can you speak into the mic, Ms. Pinus? Yep. Um, uh, Ms. Garcia, um, Anna Cruz. Fernando Quesada. Perdón, no estamos haciendo la traducción. Si escucharon su nombre, por favor, uh, vengan al podio y hagan su comentario. Can you read the names again, Ms. Pinus? Uh, Ms. Garcia. La señora Garcia. Ana Cruz. Ana Cruz. Fernando Quesada. Fernando Quesada. Si puede decir su nombre y en qué artículo está haciendo comentario y si quiere hacer uh, comentario en general. Buenas tardes. 
y va a necesitar traducción, ¿verdad? Sí. Ok. Uh, we will need someone to translate for, for him, please. Um, ¿En qué, qué artículo quiere uh, comentar? 6 y 7. 6 y, 6 y 7. ¿Y ¿Quiere hablar en, en público general? Sí, quiero sí. hablar las dos mociones de lo, sobre la venta de las comidas. Ok. So vamos a darle tre, tres minutos y vamos a, a, a ponerle pausa a su tiempo para darle la oportunidad al traductor que traduzca sus palabras. Ok. Okay. Y si puede hablar como una frase o dos frases a la vez para darle la oportunidad para la traducción. Ok. Ok. Siga adelante. Sí, buenas tardes. Mi nombre es Fernando Quesada. Hello, my name is Fernando Quesada. Good soy, soy vendedor ambulante como por 20 años en el área de Los Ángeles. I'm a street salesman in uh, Los Angeles. Específicamente en el área de Vermont y la Melrose. Es una área noventas uh, specifically in Vermont and uh, Melrose y le estoy pidiendo a todos los concejales que nos apoyen en esa, en esa área porque nosotros no queremos ser acosados pagamos impuestos mm -hmm. eh, porque hemos sido descriminalizados eh, perseguidos por las autoridades no por todas las autoridades pero siempre se da eso I'm asking for help because uh us in that area have been harassed by the authorities and also with the amount of taxes imposed on us and uh, we are asking for the authorities to uh, s stop harassing us. Nosotros pertenecemos al Distrito 13. Uh, we belong to District 13. Por eso le pedimos el apoyo necesario. That's why we ask for uh, your uh, necessary support. No somos tan difíciles porque nos gusta sacar nuestros permisos y pagar impuestos. Uh, it's not very difficult, we ask, because uh, we just ask for, uh, for uh, less taxes and uh, for your uh, help. Queremos trabajar junto con ustedes de la ciudad para que podamos llegar a un diálogo, un acuerdo, para que no existan esos, esos acosos hacia los vendedores ambulantes. We just want to work with you from the city so that we can reach an agreement so that we don't get uh, harassed by the authorities and by excessive taxes. Y sobre la venta de las comidas también que como hemos visto cómo le han recogido las cosas a los vendedores ambulantes cuánto pierden estos vendedores ambulantes cuando les decomisan and also with the sales of uh, food uh, because us uh, salesmen on the street we uh, we lose a lot of our products from uh, the harassment and from the, the search and seizure that we are subject to que ya se haga oficial aunque sea un permiso temporal para las comidas Uh, I hope you can make it official, uh, at least even if it would just be temporary, uh, for us to have a permit to sell food. Porque nosotros necesitamos vender para llevar alimentos a nuestras casas. Tenemos familia que mantener. Because we need to, uh, we, we need to make a living so that we can have enough food in our houses because we have families to support and maintain. Y gracias a cada uno de ustedes, señores concejales, sabemos que está en, su, en sus manos ayudarlos. Ustedes saben que no es regalado, que nosotros pagamos impuestos. And uh, thank you to uh, the council for hearing me out. And uh, this is out now in your hands and uh, we, we wish that you guys can, can uh, help us out. Muchas gracias, señor Quesada, por sus comentarios. Si sí, puede decir su nombre y en qué artículos uh, quiere comentar y si quiere hablar en, en público, uh, hablar en general. Okay. Um, good afternoon. My name is Ana Cruz and I am, uh, I would like to give a public comment on item number six and item number seven on today's agenda. Um, I am an organizer with Community Power Collective and I would like to make a comment on point number six and seven on today's agenda. I support the temporary food permit for vendors who are in the process of obtaining the necessary permits to legalize their business. In my experience as a street vendor, it is complex and difficult to obtain all the necessary permits to operate a street food business. This temporary permit will help sellers to sell without fear of confiscations of their sales products. At the same time, will help them navigate and have support in obtaining the health permits. Also, I support the creation of special districts since the current street vending rules 
where we have A, no vending zones, only displaced vendors from their communities. Special districts could support vendors who already sell in these communities like Hollywood. And it will be a model <coughs> that could be replicated at other districts in the city of Los Angeles, such as CD1 and CD9, to mention a few where there are already a large number of street vendor communities. Members of this committee, I ask for your support on these points to be able to support the community of street vendors to legalize their business so that they can continue in their communities. Thank you. Thank you so much for your comments. Buenas tardes, mi nombre es Hermene Gilda García y apoyo la moción 6 y 7 y mi comentario público. Ok, va a quedarle tres minutos y si no, se puede hablar una frase o dos a la vez para darle la oportunidad al traductor que diga sus palabras en inglés. Bueno, estoy aquí porque quisiera que por favor nos apoyen a los vendedores ambulantes para que tengamos la oportunidad de tener un permiso temporal de comida y vender sin el temor de sufrir por la demo, demo, de la democomización de nuestros alimentos. Okay. Así tendríamos. Uh, so I, si uh -huh. podemos uh, hacer una pausa para darle al traductor, gracias. Yes, okay. I thank you. I, I would ask you for your support for us uh, street vendors so that we can sell food and have a permit to do so without having to suffer the uh, seizure of our goods from the authorities. Así tendríamos tiempo para comprar mi propio carrito y proporcionar más a este país, ya que estamos en una situación muy difícil. And also so that I would have time to buy my own cart to uh, be able to sell food and also to uh, provide for this country because right now it is a very difficult moment. Y pues también queremos pues pedirles el apoyo, ¿verdad? A todos los concejales, pues que por favor pues nos apoyen para que pues este país también pues nos ayude, ¿verdad? Y, y también nosotros económicamente apoyemos a este país y, y pues ahora sí que ahorita estamos aquí presentes para eso mismo. And also to ask the council members to please uh, help us and for this country to please help us uh, economically because we also are here to, to help this country and to provide for you guys. Pues queremos que por favor pues no tomen más, tomen más este atención a nosotros los vendedores ambulantes ya que queremos la oportunidad así como también ustedes la tienen con su propio trabajo verdad este nosotros siempre tomamos en cuenta a cada uno de ustedes así queremos que también ustedes hagan así por nosotros. And also uh, to have you guys pay more attention to us, the uh, street vendors, uh, so that we would have an opportunity as you guys also have an opportunity uh, in your work. Uh, we want uh, you guys to, to take that into, into account so that we can have uh, uh, a better life and more opportunities to help. Y pues, muchas gracias. Otra vez le vuelvo a repetir, apóyenos por favor. Apóyenos. Muchas gracias. Dios me los bendiga a todos y cada uno de ustedes. Buenas tardes. And, yeah, thank you so much. And we're just asking for you guys to please, please support us. Please, please support us. Uh, thank you so much. And God bless you guys. And uh, have a good afternoon. Muchas gracias, Señora Garcia. Do you have any more uh, folks to speak? All right. We do. Um, Inez Juarez, Javier Sanchez, Lionel Mares, Mares. Miguel Perez and Sergio Jimenez. Buenas tardes a todos, señores concejales. Hello, City Council. Mi nombre es Miguel Pérez y voy a hablar sobre el tema uh, 6 y 7, comentario público. My name is Miguel Pérez. I'm going to speak about uh, items 6 and 7 as well as uh, public commentary. Apoyo las dos mociones, el 6 y el 7. Uh, yes, please support both uh, motions, 6 and 7. 
Porque son dos puntos muy importantes para los vendedores ambulantes. Because they are both very important for us uh, street sellers and vendors. Yo he sido vendedor ambulante y ahora como organizador de vendedores ambulante. I've been a street vendor and now I'm an uh, organizer for street vendors. En el 2018, cuando se legalizó la venta ambulante de la S946. Uh, in 2018, uh, when it, was, it became legal, the SN949. Hubo un festejo de todos los vendedores ambulante, menos los demás vendedores que quedaron excluidos a... Uh, como áreas de 90. There was a uh, celebration amongst all street vendors, except for the ones that were excluded in uh, area 90. Porque yo vendía en Exposition Park. Because I was uh, selling in Exposition Park. Y se ha luchado por tantos años para que este espacio sea un área especial. And I have fought for many years for this to be a special uh, zone. Por eso, ahora como organizador, he estado organizando en tres uh, áreas de uh, Distrito 9, Distrito 6 y también en el área de Kevin de León. Uh, because as an organizer, we have been, I've been uh, working in the three areas, District 9, District 6, and also in the area of uh, Kevin de León. Y por eso necesitamos de su liderazgo para que trabajar juntos para hacer áreas especiales donde hay muchos vendedores ambulantes. And that is why we need your leadership to work together for uh, specific areas uh, where there are street vendors. Porque creemos que solo uh, vendedores ambulantes organizados es uh, la venta ambulante organizada es una venta ordenada. Because we believe that uh, street vendors that uh, are organized are also uh, street vendors that operate in an orderly fashion. Pero necesitamos de su liderazgo para poder trabajar junto, organizadores, con uh, concejales de cada distrito, y también con los vendedores. Because, but we need your leadership to work together with uh, organizers and uh, council members, as well as the street vendors. Con lo que es la venta de comida, también necesitamos ese permiso temporal. And for uh, the street vendors, we need that, uh, that temporary permit. Se está trabajando con el condado para los carritos, pero esto está alargando mucho y necesitamos los permisos temporales. Gracias. And uh, working with the, with the county, we need uh, the permit so that we can have our, we need We have our carts, but now we need the, the permit so that we can uh, resume our operations. Uh, thank you so much. Okay, muchas gracias por sus comentarios. Please state your name and the items you Buenas used. tardes. Si puede dar su nombre en cuáles uh, temas quiere hablar y si quiere hablar en, 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 en general. Uh, voy a hacer este comentario público y hablar sobre el artículo 6 y 7. Okay. Sí, buenas tardes, señores concejales. Mi nombre es Javier Sánchez y he sido eh, negociante por más de 25 años, pero por la situación de la pandemia tuve que este, dejar mi negocio en algo en, en donde rentaba y ahora me toca ser, por, digo, por cuatro años ser un vendedor ambulante. Good evening. Uh, I'm going to talk on Article 6 and 7. And my name is Javier Sánchez. And I've been a business person for over 25 years, and then due to the pandemic, I had to stop my business and became a street vendor. Y soy un vendedor del Distrito 13, ahí en Maratón y Vermont. Y estamos pidiendo apoyo para las dos mociones 6 y 7. Estamos pidiendo también que se hagan áreas especiales para poder trabajar. Okay, and I am a street vendor in District 13 in the Marathon in Vermont, and I am asking for support on, for the, the six and seven um, items. Yeah, queremos es un distrito especial para esa zona para poder seguir trabajando y no ser no ser hostigado por por algunos este empresarios 
o, o, o gente que, que tiene sus grandes negocios. So, and what we want is like a special district so we can work there and we are not being, so we are not harassed by all the big companies. Sí, porque en eh, eh, nuestra área realmente la, la, la policía, el BSS, no, no, es, no es mucho problema, son, son, los problemas son más con, con la comunidad o los negocios grandes que tienen tanto dinero para estar este, rentando lugares grandes y a nosotros nos quieren desplazar de nuestra zona de trabajo. Because our problem is not exactly with the police, but with those people in the community, they have a lot of money and they have like big businesses and they are trying to displace us. They want to um, get our places so we cannot do our job. Y también vengo a pedirles para que se haga un este, den permisos para la venta de comida, porque esa venta de comida es de nosotros, es cultural lo que hacemos. I also came here to request that we are granted permits to sell food. This is a cultural thing. What we sell, what we eat is a cultural food. Sí, es todo. Muchas gracias. And that's all. Thank you so much. Muchas gracias por sus comentarios. Thank you so much. Please state your name and the items you'd like to speak on. Yeah, good afternoon. My name is Sergio Jimenez, Community Power Collective in the LA Street Vending Campaign. I'd like to speak on item six, seven, and also public comment, please. Great, you have three minutes. As a street vendor organizer, I have seen the implementation of the city ordinance with multiple lenses. I saw the massive relief and joy when vendors organized against the odds in legalized vending in the state and when they received their vending permit for the first time. But I have, I've also seen the wicked side of the ordinance one that continues to disregard vendors as a legitimate economic vehicle. The current city ordinance has many failures that need to be corrected in order, to, in order for vendors to succeed. Hundreds of vendors have been historically cited because of these failures. Hundreds of vendors are having to pay hundreds of dollars in fines, in reinvestment in their, their equipment, and in food because the rules deny vendors a legal path towards legitimacy. I'm happy here to support these two motions, six and seven, and I'm glad that they're being heard today because it will help vendors continue onto the path toward legitimacy. Vendors continue to be criminalized and bullied because they can't purchase a legal car with a proper health department permit. This adds to the violent narrative that violates and disregards vendors. So developing a temporary food permit is key to dismantle the hostile perception that vendors decline to legalize and abide by food regulations. But I'm concerned that only two areas are being discussed to implement special vending districts instead of the rest. And revamping the very same ordinance that's riddled with failures is silent. What about the other no vending zones that need to be abolished? Do these vendors not matter? We're seeing the adoption of a blueprint that the city council enacted by establishing no vending zones in other cities throughout LA. And that cannot happen. I applaud the motion to establish special vending districts. We've been advocating for those special vending districts since day one. But we also have to focus on going to the root of the problem and would encourage everyone in this committee and in the full city council to in invest in revamping the entire ordinance to ensure that all avenues of success are in place for our community vendors. Our vending community fully supports these two motions but they also want a deeper solution to the institutional problem that finds a way all the time to criminalize them. Thank you. Thank you so much for your comments. Do we have any other speakers, uh, Ms. Pinus? Yeah. Uh, we have a few who we called earlier. Um, any, have, new fo any new speakers? Yeah, okay. no, no new speakers. Just uh, the ones we called earlier, Goat Puppet, Mike Sorry. Greenspan, Inez Suarez, and Lionel Mares. Mr. Greenspan, your name was called earlier, uh, but I'm glad you're here today. Please, just uh, like the items you'd like to speak on. Um, all of them and public comment. Okay, you have three minutes. Okay. Um, first of all, let's go to item five, because I noticed that you've got a contract with the trustees of University of Pennsylvania, but we're in California. I mean, if you were in Delaware, maybe, okay. But hey, couldn't you go to UCLA? Couldn't you go to um, Loyola? 
couldn't you go do a contract, of course, with USC? We always know. They love lucrative contracts. Don't take my word for it. Ask Curley. Mark Ridley Thomas that did a quid pro quo to get a very good lucrative contract, 530000 steered over to USC. Now, why we're, we're exporting contracts, I do not know. But I figured I had to come here to specifically talk about this item first. And then let's talk about sidewalks. Because as we talk about vending permits and sidewalks, there should be a law. If you're going to have sidewalk vending, there should be a minimum width on a sidewalk. I'm not saying be Telegraph Avenue in, in Berkeley, but don't be a jammed in crowded Alvarado Street. Maybe you need to take away that parking lane on Alvarado Street, widen the sidewalks. We widen roads for road construction. Why don't we widen sidewalks and make those zones for street vending? And then people like the pedestrians could walk by, and if you're interested, you go look at items, and if not, hey, just keep walking. So then you aren't blocking traffic. I, I don't mean to pick on Alvarado Street, but it's one of the worst as far as pedestrian traffic and sidewalk vending. Now, as far as food, I sure hope they are applying it equally. I sure hope they are applying it fairly. I sure hope things are clean so we don't spread more disease. Now, public comment. Um, first of all, we have a lot of things to talk about. And one of the things about this, we need to have a way that the people who are in the street vending business are not edging out and driving out the brick and mortar places because the brick and mortar places are giving you more tax revenue so you can waste it. You aren't going to get that much tax revenue from the street vendors compared to the brick and mortar. So you chase out the brick and mortar, you got nothing. You won't even have any of those money trees that uh, fat pig Paul Coretz planted when he left office before he lost his next race. So you don't even have money to pick off the trees. And I know you guys think money grows on trees and then you even got that cunt Janet Hahn over there, Board of Supervisors, to go come in to Districts 3 and 5 and pick those, the money off those Jewish money trees planted by Paul Koretz. Yes, keep picking the money off the trees. Thank you so much, Mr. Greenspan. Please state your name and the items you'd like to speak on. Uh, signed up as a goat puppet, nigger developer, all items and general comment. Yes, and again, Hugo, thank you for holding this meeting at exactly the same fucking time as the Energy Committee and calling public comment exactly at the same time, right to reading the instructions. So I recorded both of these meetings, and I'm going to play it for the public side by side to show what a criminal enterprise you are. Now, we get a number one, Corolla Sanchez, don't know who it is. Don't join these motherfuckers. Look at this, look at this motherfuckers up here. There, look at Hugo hiding the, the, the swastika Nazi fucking staffer. Hell, that never got voted a single vote, spends two years Which in office. Which item are you speaking on, Mr. Spinner? No, it's item one. Okay. No, nobody nobody should, should volunteer and serve on these commissions unless they're paid. Unless they're fucking paid, man. You guys, none of this volunteer bullshit. One of these volunteers sued the city's getting 100000 fucking dollars. How about... How about Hugo? Let's give him a hand there, right? A black man that served on a committee on one of your volunteer committees got racially attacked. He had to sue the city. Two fucking years, a lousy hundred thousand fucking dollars. You know how much the lawyer gets? Right? He gets half of that. What the fuck is that? You know? So you got all this other shit like sidewalk vending. You don't need no goddamn sidewalk vending. You want a business? Oh, rent a fucking space. Pay fucking rent. Sign a fucking lease, get a fucking license, like my grandfather did, like my father did. The fuck is it with you guys? You know, I don't, I don't want to have a lease. I don't want to pay rent. I don't want to file taxes. Well, what the fuck do you think the rest of the four million Angelinos want? So the people that are paying the taxes now, what the fuck do you think they're going to do? You going to give them reparations? 
How about you pay the businesses a million each to leave the fucking city, and you can turn it all into shopping carts and fucking vending machines. How about that? See, you guys want it both ways. You don't get it both ways. And now we're going to get into general comment. Why does this criminal enterprise of a city council schedule two committee meetings at exactly the same time? So you can't speak at only one. Eunice is a member of both committees. She can't be upstairs to handle multi-million dollar energy contracts. She has to sit the fuck here and hand it over to, the Jew, to two Jews upstairs. See, this is the fucking problem, right? You have two meetings at the same time, that means you have to have two separate city attorneys, you have to have two separate sergeant at arms, you gotta cost the city multi, multi, hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. And you do it because you are in a criminal conspiracy. And I'm here in the meeting this morning, and I, and I, and I stand in the back, all the way in the back, and I'm wiggling my arms, and I get thrown up a fucking meeting because they said I'm disrupting the fucking meeting. I'm not disrupting the fucking meeting. You guys are disrupting my city. You guys are fucking my city up. But at least I'll say one thing about Heather Hutt. You cleaned up Lafayette Park Place and, and Sherman uh, Wilshire Boulevard today. Now get the encampment Thank you so much, out Mr. of the fucking Thank you so much. Thank you so much for your comments. Thank you so much. And please, uh, please do not disrupt this meeting, Mr. Spindler. Uh, uh, my apologies to the people uh, who have to listen through this vile, disturbing, and repulsive comments. Uh, they do not reflect this committee or 99.999% of the city of Los Angeles that doesn't use this kind of language. Um, so let's go into uh, the, the, the items I've, I've uh, asked to be on consent. That's on 567. Uh, can we call the roll on that, Mr. Espinosa? Thank you, Council Member um, Soto Martinez. Yes. Council Member Hutt? Yes. Council Member Hernandez? Yes, but I have some comments. We could drive to the okay, vote. Yeah. Great, thank you. Yes. And you have comments on which item? Six. On item number six. Would you like to hold that to the side and just take items number five and seven right now in consent? And then we could take item number six afterwards, after the comments? Sure, let's go ahead and do that. Okay, so this is for items number five and seven. Council Member Soto Martinez. Yes. Council Member Hutt. Yes. Council Member Hernandez. Yes. Council Member Padilla. Yes. And Council Member Rodriguez. Aye. So items number five and seven are approved. Okay, great. Let's go to, uh, let's read item six for a vote. Or a any comments on item number six? Yes, please. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, you know, I appreciate the purpose of this motion but I, I don't understand how this will address the clear violations of state law that the city is, of LA is upholding. Um, and I wanna preface this by saying that, you know, my alleged director has been doing uh, legislative work around street vending for a very long time. And so we've, we've had many discussions, but I'm, I'm trying to understand. And you know, all the new, all the no vending zones in the city are currently violating state law. And in response to litigation against the city, you know, the city attorney is planning to address various legal issues that are now being contested, both the no vending zones and other items, uh, such as the buffer zones around schools and swap meets. Um, I have some concerns around that because I have a lot of schools in my district where there is street vending, uh, but I, find, I would find it hard to, you know, remove, for example, like food, fruit or vegetable vendors uh, from around those areas. Um, it is also my understanding that petitioners have come to the city with recommendations and asked to be brought on as a thought partner so that we don't have to go to, through trial. Uh, they have also been pursuing these poly policy recommendations for many years. I really hope um, and I urge that the city begin to engage um, our partners in the community to resolve some of these specific legal issues. I think it just would be helpful instead of having to go through trial. And I appreciate the work being done and the important process that will be happening in CD 13 and 4 with the special vending zones. Uh, but there's no question in my mind that we need to eliminate the no vending zones and carefully review the other swaths of the city uh, that we have de facto banned vending, such as around schools and swap meets. Um, I can tentatively support this motion moving forward today with the expectation that elimination of no vending zones and addressing other components of the litigation will be a part of the legal resolution. Uh, because as it stands now, I think uh, there's certain things that we are missing and not achieving the goal that we're trying to put forward with this motion. 
Thank you so much, Mr. Hernandez. Um, go ahead, Ms. Padilla. Yes, I also just, um, in relation to item six, just want to say that, you know, I'm never a fan of these motions when they don't say that there's going to be a report back in 30 days or 60 days or 90. Um, and this motion does not necessarily instruct that. So I'm curious, do we know when we're going to potentially get this back or, or is it going to go straight to public works, trade, travel, and tourism? I guess this is a procedural question. Who can answer that? So CLA, um, the item is going to public works afterward. So yes, and then once it's approved by um, then, then it goes to council and then the, and then the report back work starts. So it's after council fully approves the motion where the city departments get together and start working on it. Okay, so then we have time to add a deadline to it. That's it would correct. be possible for me to at council add a deadline to when we want to see this. You, you, you may wish to amend it right now if you like. Okay. Are you saying do we now? If you, you can provide that instruction as an amendment now if you want to say I want to report back in 90 days. Yeah, I'd like a report back, uh, I would say 60 days. Okay. Please. A report back, what can you just state to the amendment? I'm sorry? What, what can you just, a report back for what? Well, the way it reads, it sounds like we're going to get some kind of a report back that talks to us about what are the lessons learned so far. So I'd like to, I don't want this to be something that gets dragged out. This is something that's important for me to see what is described as a lesson learned so that we can go from there. Sure. That's fine. I would accept that as an amendment. Yeah, I'll second it. Okay, uh, I just I have some comments about this. So this was a motion. Uh, first of all, I, I agree with everything that's being said by Councilmember Hernandez and Councilmember Padilla. Uh, I was very happy to put this motion forward. Um, I think my uh, my love for street vendors I think is pretty public. Uh, my parents were street vendors most of my life, uh, and yes, and there is a lawsuit that's currently happening right now, uh, brought forward by uh, folks out there vending in the streets. Um, but this motion has, does not interfere with that lawsuit. That lawsuit is moving forward and folks uh, you know, are fighting that in the courts. Um, and so this, the two things, although related, are not uh, mutually exclusive. Um, I think, and a lot of the folks that are here today, uh, I know personally because uh, uh, these vend some of these vendors were under attack uh, even before I ran in office. I, I supported them in developing their committee uh, and creating strategy and doing so many things. So I, I know them intimately. Um, the purpose of this motion is to show a model for the city of Los Angeles. Uh, it's a responsibility that I've taken very personal. Um, I, I know what happens to street vendors every single day uh, through my own lived experience and what I witness every single day. And so the purpose of this motion is to essentially demonstrate that we don't have to have these kinds of laws and, and treat people this, this kind of way. And I believe that I can deliver a model for the city that centers the street vendors, but also brings folks uh, into collaboration so we can show the world that we don't have to choose between one or the other. And so uh, I'm you know, obviously very excited about doing this. I know it's gonna take some hard work and some time, but that will center the street vendors and there will be a, a big part of the discussions that, that happen. So I just wanted to sort of give that background. I know we didn't, I didn't talk about it, but just want to express that. Yes, Ms. Rodriguez. Thank you. And you know, um, <clears throat> this is not a very simple conversation to have. Uh, since the kind of evolution from the first adoption of a street vending ordinance, uh, before it was formally adopted and the state law passed, it was adapted and amended uh, to get into compliance. Um, I will say it, it's, it's a challenging issue, but it does require complete cooperation from all parties involved. Uh, it, it, right now we don't, you know, and I, I've said this, uh, while we may have an ordinance in place, the lack of enforcement means we don't have an ordinance in place. And I just want to be really clear about that. Uh, there has been a redaction and a lot of uh, lead time to allow for compliance that has been provided. There has been ample education efforts, uh, and you know, again, we still struggle with the well, you know, hands off, 
we can't do that. And, and we still have very real public safety concerns that need to be addressed. Now, I, you know, again, I'm a huge supporter. Um, in fact, uh, the initial, I, I, I worked for Mike Hernandez when the very first street vending district was created in MacArthur Park. It helped to address a lot of the illicit activity that was engaged in, in, in MacArthur Park uh, that for individuals that were uh, using the protections as, uh, as a means of protecting some of the illicit activity. So there's a balance to all of the things that we need to do and strike in this, and it's not to punitively uh, address, uh, it, it's not to be punitive to those that are legitimately trying to operate a business. In fact, um, I know a number of districts, including my own, we just opened up uh, at Lenchita's uh, shared commercial kitchen because we want to create the space to enable uh, vendors to be able to prepare uh, their items in a safe, in a compliant, uh, health-focused manner. Uh, but you also see the circumstances of individuals, as you know, Mr. Sota Martinez, we talked about. Uh, the it's, I mean, it's no longer even just bottles of water. It's it's uh, it, it's margaritas. It's and it's you know it, it's there's liquor being served in certain circumstances. So, um, and I've had situations like that even bubble up at Hanson Dam, for example, that then, you know, it was a circumstance that kind of denigrated into violence erupting and everything. So there, there has to be a balance to all of these conversations and I just want to preface that to say that we understand. I, I think there's no question that this is a council that embraces and supports street vending. Uh, we will all continue to be, I, I think it's part of LA culture, I think it's part of every uh, important, uh, it, it's something that's really important and near and dear to me, uh, and I enjoy seeing it, but I also want to make sure that what we do is a legally permissible manner in which it doesn't uh, further put both vendors, to be honest, I think vendors have become, frankly, an increasing target, born out of frustration, uh, and we've seen vendors sadly become targets in places like South Los Angeles where I've seen violence erupt. And so I think for, for all parties involved, we want to make sure that there are adequate, um, you know, we, we pay adequate attention to the details of how we do this, but that everybody come along to be part of the solution and that we understand that when we create a policy, that everyone subscribes to actually helping to enforce that policy even with fellow vendors because otherwise it doesn't work and it's punitive to those who follow the rules and it's a blatant disregard by those who don't and it really undermines the progress for everyone and i say that very explicitly because there have been bad actions on on many fronts and we need to make sure that we all row in the same direction to have a compliant process that respects the opportunities that we're providing vendors in the city, that we respect people's right to have a sidewalk that they can walk on, uh, that uh, vendors and, and restaurant owners and everyone, that, that everyone just respects each other. We're trying to provide the proper space, but not do so at the detriment of someone else. And I think everyone needs to really honor and respect that for public health and safety, but also just the mere public safety concerns that have also been born out of a lack of enforcement. And I just, I have to speak truth to power as much as I love uh, the vending and what it provides as a cultural environment in our city and how as important as it is. Remember, everyone needs to remember whatever side you're on, be on the side of getting everybody on the same page. And I look forward to all the parties and the advocates uh, and, you know, it took a long time to get the county to come to terms with how we can get a compliant card. There's been, there's been a lot of things that are outside of our own purview uh, that we've had to struggle with over the last couple of years. But I think everyone has to remember that there are rules that we all need to abide by. And I look forward to this advancing so that we can have a responsible and actionable method of assuring public safety, public health, and everyone honoring and respecting the rules that we implement in this city as we come to terms and, and agreements and compromise in these conversations. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Rodriguez. Ms. Padilla, want to say something? Again, just, you know, again I, I'm gonna, I want to follow this closely. That's why I, I don't want this to be something that just lingers. Um, 
I'm interested in figuring it out for my own district, being very intentional about having somebody specifically on, specific on my team focus on it. So to kind of see what you guys have in mind for Hollywood is something that I'm really gonna lean on. Um, but other than that, no further comments. Thank you so much, Ms. Padilla. I just uh, wanted to clarify. Um, sure. She asked, uh, Councilwoman Padilla, you asked for a um, 60-day report back. When you read the movers, some of these are longer term. The, the second mover, however, um, may be more applicable to a 60-day report back, and that has to do with developing objective criteria compliant with state law for limited street bending zones. But some of these other movers, when you read through them, they're, they're actually kind of longer term issues. So um, that would mean that the report backs could come in waves, right? So we would have one report back with some initial information, but some of these other movers are, are meant to be longer term. What do you mean by, how much time would you give long term? Well, okay, so for example, the last um, mover on there talks about um, lessons learned. So that wouldn't be back um, before you until later. The others have to do with uh, developing an ordinance, so then council would need to um, first see the framework before we start writing up the ordinance. And then uh, the third mover has to do with meeting organizations and stakeholders and working with council offices and that may take some time, so. Well then, um, could we do 60 days with a plan of action to do the second half? Yes, yes, I think we could do that. I mean, the, the second mover right there uh, with developing the objective criteria and then bringing something to you, I mean, that's, that could be done in 60 days. Yes, I think maybe that's kind of what we should do. In 60 days, come back with what you can report back on, but make sure that the report back has um, steps related to how you can get us the rest of the stuff, including recommendations for a potential ordinance or things of that sort. Thank you, we got it. And Thank how you. you're gonna meet with the stakeholders. Thank you. Okay, so it sounds like we're adding the 60-day report back on the first moving clause, or what's uh, the second, 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 second moving the clause. Second. Okay, all right. Uh, all right, in, in closing, I, I just wanna say that um, I, I'm glad we just turned into a discussion um, because uh, the folks in the, in, in the audience today can see you know, how much of this policy is made. Uh, I think what's very clear is that all of us want street vending. Uh, how it looks like uh, might have difference of opinions, right? And that's something that folks should, should be very mindful of that. Um, I, I do wanna say that this discussion would not have been possible without the street vendors in the room right now. Uh, I remember when the street vending campaign started in, I think it was like 2013, 2014, it was like, it, even, it was if it, it lived under a different organization. And I remember taking my parents to those meetings. There was meetings all across the city. I took my parents to the South Central meetings. Even though they weren't street vendors, I wanted them to see that many of the things that they experienced and I experienced as a young child uh, now had an ability for us to change in the city. And so since then, uh, this uh, advocacy has grown to passing state laws and folks understanding their rights and how they can influence policy. These laws uh, that were on the books that criminalized folks, uh, an entire city, uh, and how my parents were harassed uh, by different departments, uh, those laws reflect, did not reflect any input of the street vendors. Now it does. It reflects those folks, so as you continue to work on this, on this issue, I just want you to recognize that, that you are all taking power into your own hands and you are becoming part of the discussion of what the city, uh, what the city policy looks like. So I encourage folks to con continue to engage in this process. This is how democracy works. It's not just voting on a, for an elected, but it's about engaging every single day and pushing your electors to do the right thing. And so, um, you know, again, very happy that this is happening today. Um, and that's it. Uh, can we please uh, call the call this item vote for this item, Mr. Espinosa? Thank you, Councilmember Soto Martinez. Yes. Councilmember Hutt. Oh yes. <laughs> Sorry. Councilmember Hernandez. Yes. Councilmember Padilla. Yes. And Councilmember Rodriguez. Aye. This item is approved as amended. Thank you so much, Mr. Espinosa. Espinosa one or two? <laughs> Espinosa one. Thank you. Uh, 
anyways, for the audience, we have two Espinosas in the room. So if you're listening online, we have two Espinosas. So Espinosa one, Espinosa two. Uh, all right, let's go to uh, item number four. Let's do this. Too. Can we read item four into the record? I mean, sorry, uh, read the item, please. Thank you. Item number four is a motion for Council Member Soto Martinez, Harris Dawson, Hutt, and Lee relative to the review of related fines and fees levied by the city and exploring alternatives to fix fine and fee amounts. And this item was also referred to the Transportation Committee as well as the Budget, Finance, and Innovation Committee. Great. Uh, I believe we have a, an amendment from Mr. Hernandez. Yes. Give me one second. Great. So I further move that the chief legislative analyst with support from the Los Angeles Homeless, Homeless Services Authority, LASA, and with requested input from the city attorney, the Los Angeles Police Department, the Los Angeles County Public Defender's Office, as well as legal aid organizations and homeless service providers, report back in 120 days on all city departments with the authority to issue monetary citations and the most frequent non-felony citations and fees incurred by people experiencing homelessness. I further move that the CLA with the requested input from the city attorney report within 120 days on the council's statutory authority to reduce or eliminate monetary fees for citations issued to people experiencing homelessness, as well as the ability to retroactively rescind or expunge any fees. Right. I'll second that. Thank you. Great, uh, any discussion on this item? Okay, let's call, uh, let's call this item as, as amended. Thank you, and as clarification, this, these two amendments will be in addition to the existing recommendations. Okay, let's call the Thank item, you. the roll on that. Council Member Soto Martinez. Yes. Council Member Hutt. Yes. Council Member Hernandez. Yes. Council Member Padilla. Yes. And Council Member Rodriguez. Aye. That's five ayes, and this item is also approved as amended. Okay, thank you so much, Mr. Espinosa. Can we read item one into uh, the record, please? Thank you. Item number one is a communication from the mayor relative to the appointment of Car Carola Sanchez to the Commission on Committee, uh, Community and Family Services. Excellent. Is Ms. Sanchez here today? Right in the front. Would you like to take a, a seat? Uh, anywhere in the front. You can pick left, right, or center. Hello, thank you so much, Ms. Uh, Sanchez. Thank you so much for your uh, desire to serve uh, with, the, at this, uh, with this great city. Um, you wanna maybe just say a few words and perhaps we have some questions for you? Yeah, yeah. Hi everyone, my name is Carola Sanchez. Um, uh, first of all, I just wanna say thank you to the commission team to be able to help me out with the whole process. It was a new process for me. And thank you for letting us lead California too for recommending me um, to the mayor's office. Um, just a little bit about me. Um, I grew up in Orange County in an immigrant Peruvian household, um, and education was key for my for my household. And um, so, I, when I was going to community college, I started volunteering at um, at a school, and then got into education. I worked in education for around six years. Um, from there, I started from a college day, became a sub, and became a sub in not only. Um, Long Beach Unified, but Alhambra, LA Unified as well. I became a teacher, um, and then afterwards, after working in many locations um, as a sub, um, and then going into policy, and got my master's in public administration, um, and worked at LA Metro um, for a few years, and now working for ICF as well, as a grant administrator, senior housing analyst. That's awesome. Latinas lead. As you can see, there's three Latinas on, on this uh, on this committee, so uh, very that. appropriate. <laughs> um, I just have I just uh, yeah one two three one okay, two yeah. three. <laughs> uh, just w I have one quick question. So I, I this is one of my favorite departments. Uh, you know, it's an anti-poverty department. You'll be serving on the commission on community and family services. Uh, any sort of uh, ideas that you have for this com uh, for this uh, committee? Uh, they do a lot of amazing work. I'm just curious to see what you know your, your thoughts are on on trying to improve it or make it better or whatever. You know, just whatever ideas you have for this. Yeah, yeah. I was looking into like the research and what was provided um, for the past two days, and I do think that, um, of course, community engagement and outreach is super important. 
um, language accessibility is really huge. I also did that when I was at LA Metro as the review panel. Um, so besides that, just being able to bring um, not only like we, we know that you know LA has lots of resources, but yet for them to be able to know about it is really huge and be able to use that. Um. Excellent. Uh, any questions for um, Ms. Sanchez from, from, from our folks here? Yeah, Ms. Rodriguez, Rogers. Ms. Sanchez, thank you so much for, uh, for agreeing to be nominated. Uh, thank you for filling out the financial disclosures. That had been a challenge previously, but I'm happy to see that that's now getting reconciled. Um, the only thing I want to point out is, and I, I look at the uh, composition of this commission, and the intent of the commissions are to really serve the interests of everyone across the city. Um, however, there is no representation for the San Fernando Valley, the entirety of the San Fernando Valley, which represents half of the city's population. And so, um, you know, my only ask, I'm not going to ask you a question about it, my only ask is that um, given the importance and the significance of uh, there, so often I think it's overlooked and unrecognized that the San Fernando Valley does have its share of families that are struggling with poverty. Uh, the combination of the district that both uh, Ms. Padilla and I have the privileges of, of representing, um, you know, and certain pockets throughout the remaining parts of the San Fernando Valley have a great deal of need. And so the work and the role and the responsibility of the commission is to ensure that, you know, when we have conversations, everyone likes to loosely use the word equity. What it means in practicality is a different issue. Um, <clears throat> and so I just, I, I, I say this to you now because as you, as you commence in this role, uh, it's really important that uh, you also uh, become a shared voice since there is an absence on this commission for any representation on this, for the San Fernando Valley, that you are mindful of it, uh, that you keep that at the forefront of the work and the lens with which you consider the items that are before you so that we do in fact achieve greater equity uh, for all of the residents in the city of Los Angeles, and particularly those of us that have the privilege of representing the Northeast San Fernando Valley, uh, not having a voice on this commission. I mean, thankfully, we're represented here well uh, on this committee, but the work of the commission is also an important part of that. So I would hope that in this role that you uh, keep the San Fernando Valley at the fore of of uh, at the forefront of your mind when you're considering and deliberating conversations uh, because know that that's that's a missing piece currently in the composition of this commission but i appreciate your willingness to serve and i thank mayor bass for your nomination and thank you for all of your uh, engagement thank you thank you thank, thank you. you so much ms rodriguez um i think Ms. sanchez got the financial disclosure memo uh loud and clear i, I know <laughs> i appreciate it the mayor's office no, I know, I know, I know you do. All right, any other comments, questions on this? Excellent. Yeah, let's go ahead, Ms. Thank Hart. You, Mr. Chair. I, I, it's always good when people step up to serve the city. So I just want to thank you for stepping up and, appreciate that. and thank serving. You. Thank you. Okay. Uh, excellent. Well, let's call the vote on uh, Ms. Sanchez's nomination. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Councilmember Soto Martinez. Yes. Councilmember Hutt. Yes. Councilmember Hernandez. Yes. Councilmember Padilla and Councilmember Rodriguez. Aye. Thank That's you so much. Eyes and this item is approved. Excellent. Thank we'll you. go to the full council. Good luck. Good luck at that venue as well. Thank you. Thank, Thank you so, so much. much. Thank you for your willingness to serve. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Let's uh, read item number one into the record. Um, I believe that was item number I'm one. Sorry, number two. Like perdón. Disculpe. Disculpe. Yes. Item number two. Thank you. Item number two is a report from the Community Investment and Families Department relative to amending the 49th program year 2023-24 consolidated plan to reprogram community develop block grant or CDBG fund property acquisition and capital improvement needs. Excellent. Thank you so much. I see we have Ms. Marquez and her team uh, to give a report on this. Good afternoon. When I started this, the floor is yours. It's great to see everyone. Thank you for giving us the time to 
walk you through our report and uh, we're happy to answer any questions before I start. I do want to introduce my colleagues who are with me. To my right is Veronica McDonald, our Assistant General Manager, and to my left is Rebecca Ronquillo who helps support all of the activities related to the management of a consolidated plan. And uh, council members, we are here before you um, to once again give you an update on where we are with respect to our CDPG expenditures. We have um, the role of serving as the administrator of the consolidated plan. The Community Investment for Families Department is the administrator. The consolidated plan does include four entitlement grants, the Community Development Block Grant, the HOPWA grant, which is all set aside for individuals with HIV and AIDS, the HOME grant, which is all set aside for the production of affordable housing, which is managed by the LA Housing Department, and the Emergency Solutions grant, the ESG grant, which is also all allocated to support our homelessness priorities priorities and allocated entirely to LASA. The CDBG grant is the grant that is the most diverse. It allows for a variety of different activities to be funded. And we currently do have a challenge with CDBG expenditures. We have been very transparent and very forthcoming in the past two years with the status of our um, CDBG expenditures. We're not waiting for these funds to be recaptured. We have been trying to be innovative and again, very, very transparent with all of you. We've met with all of the offices multiple times to talk about the status of the projects. We've engaged the departments as a department, as the administrator on the CDBG alone. We work with 19 different departments that have CDBG funding that you know range from street lighting projects, rec and park projects, economic development projects, and we engage on a regular basis with all of these departments and provide any technical assistance. We also have a very good relationship, working relationship with the HUD local office. So the work that Rebecca has been doing, we meet with them weekly to talk about any challenges that we're having. We are escalating and elevating issues if we need to. We actually just had a call with folks at the national level earlier this week, and the challenge related to CDBG timeliness is not unique to the city, unfortunately. There are a number of jurisdictions in this Western region alone, there's half of the jurisdictions right now that are being challenged with timeliness. And it's a, a variety of factors. It's the, um, the CARES money that was allocated that has a different spending timeline. It's the coronavirus funding that was initially allocated to the city that had a different timeline. It's the challenges that we're having across multiple departments with high vacancy rates and very limited capacities. So we've had to have very honest conversations. And I want to emphasize that reprogramming is not our priority. It actually creates more work for our department, who is already stretched extremely thin, because the work that we do on the consolidated plan is just one component of all of the different branches of work that our department is focused on. So I just want to walk you through some of the recommendations, and we appreciate the amendment. It is a, a figure that is constantly moving, it's in flux, and again, before coming with you with this final recommendation to reprogram, it is because we are looking at a March 30th expenditure deadline. HUD will measure our timeliness on May 2nd. And this is an automatic assessment that they do. They don't need to engage us to do this. They have access to our accounts. They're looking at how much funding has been expended. They're not looking at funds that are obligated. They're not looking at funds that are encumbered. They are looking at funds that have been expended. And so right now we are, uh, we need to draw down approximately $62 million in CDBG resources. 39 million is projected to be spent by departments in the regular course of activity. So it's the staffing charges, all of the economic development activity, capital improvement projects. 23.6 million is being recommended to be reprogrammed into three acquisition projects. We have um, our colleagues here from HACLA are here as well, but we have two HACLA projects. One is in Council District 1, which is 19.5 million. It is for multifamily affordable housing, 120 units. And the second is also a HACLA project in Council District 15 that is a land acquisition project that will build public housing, affordable housing on that site. And the third is for new economics for women in Council District 14. And these are properties along the 710 freeway that are selling at the rate of the, the housing price of the 1960s. So it is a really good opportunity for the organization to acquire these properties. 
Um, and again, we're here to answer any questions that you may have and walk you through our process. The last thing I'll say is what we did, again, as a department is we're being proactive. We're not waiting for these funds to be recaptured. We're trying to identify solutions to help us with the, our timeliness requirements. So what we did is we opened up our portal. If those of you that are familiar with this process, we have an annual application process where we work the, the mayor's office will release the letter, we'll open up the process, there's um, communication to the council, and organizations, city departments are invited to submit applications for consideration. We typically have a, a oversubscription of applications on any given year. We get $50 million annually through the CDBG entitlement grant, but once you carve off the admin dollars, the existing investments that we have, the public service dollars, we're really left with about $20 million if you think about just the, the overall pool of resources. On any given year, we get about 80 project submissions from nonprofits, from city departments, and we go through a process where we are working with the mayor, the ma mayor is engaging the members of the council to identify your priorities. Once that is um, in place is when the, the budget is prepared and adopted by the mayor and the council. What we did this time around, because we are having a timeliness challenge, is we opened up our process again mid-year to identify other projects that can, that were viable, that are eligible, that meet a national objective, that allow for us to quickly spend down on the CDBG grant so that we don't have, we don't have these funds recaptured. I want to emphasize that having these dollars recaptured means that anything that is over the allowable 1.5 times in our line of credit does have the risk of getting recaptured. That does also impact our admin cap and our public services because all that's available is what is factored into the, the allocation of public service dollars and administrative dollars. So this was a very painful exercise, but it was a very necessary exercise. And I want to emphasize that we met with every impacted council office, either with the individual council member directly or chief of staff level or deputy chief of staff, because we understand the sensitive nature of having these dollars reprogrammed. What we have done is in the uh, body of the report, there is an attachment that identifies projects that we are recommending to reprogram. They are listed on a priority project list, which means that we will be working again with all of you in subsequent years to make these projects whole. Um, again, they were, they were identified to be reprogrammed because they are not going to spend. And if we leave them, we're leaving money parked, and we have the risk of having these dollars recaptured. So I wanted to just give full context of where we are and happy to answer any questions that you may have. Yeah, thank you so much, Mrs. Mar Marquez. Um, I'll say a few things, and then I'll open it up for questions or comments. Uh, you know, I, I want to say I've, I appreciate all the work that, that you've done on this, that you and your team have done on this. Um, you know, this, uh, this came to... My attention is, I'm a freshman, right? Uh, but when I learned about this uh, in the previous committee, I was kind of like shocked. Uh, and since um, this responsibility uh, was put on this committee, I was like, well, I gotta, I gotta play an active role and, and, and you get in the weeds of it and learning about this and how the money is spent and the challenges and the personalities and everything you have to navigate uh, I just want to applaud the that you that you've gotten us to this point um, and it became even more obvious the importance of this when um, a few of us went to Washington DC and we met with uh, the secretary secretary fudge of, 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 the, of HUD and her team was there one of the first comments that came out of that team's mouth is why haven't you spent this money Right? And we were going to DC to ask for more money. Right? And they kind of, you know, kind of put it in our face. Like, it, you haven't even spent what we gave you. And, uh, you know, it, I came back with a, a, a deeper sense of urgency because our credibility at the federal level was sort of being affected. Uh, and, you know, we should always guard our credibility uh, with, sure. with, with many different things. Right? And so uh, now I was very happy that. Soon thereafter, you're like, I think I got, you know, what, what we can put forward into the committee. And so uh, thank you for getting us to this point, um, for talking to so many folks, uh, council members, chief of staff, and uh, I'm just incredibly, I just want to uplift the work that you and your team team have done uh, to get us to this point. So, thank you. Uh, and and, and, yeah, and, no. and I would say some of the stuff being reprogrammed is in District 13. 
but you know, we have to think about the whole, we have to think about how this affects the entire city and our credibility. And so, um, anyways, I just wanted to sort of acknowledge, acknowledge that for, um, for you. And if I may, I just want to express my gratitude. You have been very generous with your time in taking this role as the chair of this committee that is now reporting directly to, all of our work is now reporting directly to this committee. So we're probably going to take up a lot of your time in subsequent uh, meetings, but I really do appreciate because it is, um, it is an opportunity and an offer that we make to all of the council. We are here to be a resource. We are here to provide technical assistance. And we've updated a number of documents that are now available for us to continue to expand on. We have an updated expenditure policy. We had not updated that body of work in over a decade. Um, so there are new parameters in place, additional guidelines. So all of that work is done in collaboration with all of you. So we really appreciate you offering your support to get us to this point as well. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. Any comments or questions? I see Ms. Rodriguez, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Soto Martinez. And, you know, I really appreciate uh, that, yes, the, the shift in having the, this very important work now report to this committee is critical. And so to hear your uh, very attentive uh, uh, in, involvement is appreciated. Uh, because you. to your point, I have said repeatedly, and not just in this committee, but we have similar conversations in budget committee, um, and uh, we just had it recently on, uh, on the Olympics. This city has done, and staff has done, a remarkable job in pursuing a lot of grant dollars, whether it's ATP grants at the state to help build our city infrastructure. Uh, you know, CDBG is an important uh, and fundamental part of the work that we do to help close the gaps when it comes to uh, both housing, but even some of the social service needs that we have to provide in our city. Uh, that so often we desperately rely on, our constituencies desperately rely on, in absence of the county continuing, continuing to fall short in the roles and purposes that it's supposed to serve. Um, however, it's an embarrassment if we have to return the money because we have been unable to execute it. And so how dare you go to Washington and ask for more money when you can't even, or go to the state, if you can't even fulfill the, what we've already uh, gone after and secured uh, in terms of those resources. So that I'm, I'm so glad that you understand that perspective and context because as we have conversations uh, in budget, uh, as you know, as, for budget deliberations, but then subsequently even on the council. It's important to remember that just as much as we go through the effort of identifying and prioritizing these projects, we must fund the staff needs to implement these projects because they're a critical uh, safety net for a lot of our neighborhoods. And so I say that for this reason because it's, again, um, it, it's uh, part of being kind of the the older dog on this horseshoe uh, at this point that I think it's really important to have the, the full context of why these conversations are so important when we talk about priorities, um, you know, again, with so many competing priorities and that doesn't include, again, and, and Ms. Marquez, you captured it perfectly. Uh, you know, we couldn't have anticipated the impacts of COVID and for how long it went on and supply chain issues that also have direct implications for the delivery of these projects. All of these things, there, there's curveballs thrown at you all the time, notwithstanding the fact that, you know, E-RIPs and all these retirements and everything that happens that just constantly put um, staff under the gun to help get all these things accomplished. So fully appreciate the, uh, the difficulties but it's critically important that at every level of this government that we recognize how the most vulnerable communities or the vulnerable communities are the ones that suffer the most in these, uh, in these circumstances. And we need to really look with that lens uh, when we prioritize that once we have secured these resources for implementation, uh, that we are looking at the totality of what the impacts are gonna be should they not be fulfilled. And um, so, I, you know, I just want to thank everybody for really recognizing the importance of this process because it will continue to remain critically important. Um, but Ms. Marquez, I, I, I have a question because I know we've expended a lot of effort and resources around housing. We recognize that housing 
is a fundamental and important part of the struggles that people are experiencing. However, we also know the delays in the implementation associated with the housing, and it shouldn't be at the expense of some of these other social safety net programs that, you know, CDBG dollars are critically important to provide. So in terms of like the lens and the context of the expenditures, is there a formula or an approach, given that there has been, um, I think, you know, kind of far more expenditures dedicated. I, I, you know, look, there was a lot of reprogramming with respect to the Mayfair, for example. Right. Right. Um, that has detrimental impacts to all the other efforts that we're deploying. And so it's not, you know, that isn't the, that isn't the catch-all problem solver. Sure. And so, we're, you know, when we dedicate all of these resources to one effort, what happens to everything else and what, what other, uh, you know, what other gaps are we leaving in its place? Mm -hmm. And so, is there a formula or approach that is reflective of addressing kind of really the multitude of needs in a balanced way that you all are considering when you, when you engage in this conversations and this work? That's an excellent question. Um, before I respond, I just want to thank you for lifting, lifting up the challenges with staffing capacity to be able to execute and deliver. Um, that is the, the challenge that we heard repeatedly as we were talking mm -hmm. to city departments mm -hmm. about their ability or not to move these projects forward is uh, citywide staffing capacities. But to answer your question, council member, the, the recommendation to leverage CDBG funds for housing acquisition was a strategy. It is not the only strategy. It is not the um, singular or priority of the CDBG resources. Our commitment is to continue to support economic development, capital improvement projects, fully maximizing on the public service and the admin resources that are available. We have not created a formula-based structure yet. We're hoping that this is a solution for the now, which is related to our timeliness challenge. We do, though, want to have really honest conversations, continue to have these honest conversations about what we can do as a city when we go back, to, when we're out of, when we meet timeliness in May, mm -hmm. and we are looking at the various priorities. And what we've learned from the conversations with city departments is that, when, like for example, when we met with your office before we presented the recommendations, your office works very closely with all of the departments where you have CDBG investments. Your office was familiar with the status of these yep. projects, the, the respective, staff from the departments had already communicated to your office if there was any hiccups or delays or challenges. So we were able to have a much more informed conversation and didn't have to reprogram in the case of, you know, and so this is where we want to offer, again, additional resources and support to both every single council office mm -hmm. and the department so that we can't have honest conversations about what we can and cannot do and look at multi-year funding potentially. So we've done that in the past where we have, if the project in total needs 1.5 million, we will look at 500,000 mm -hmm. instead of having All 1 million parked, million. right? Correct. So we'll put 500,000, mm -hmm. so that's one strategy. So that's all in the expenditure policy. As I mentioned, it has been revised. Before COVID, we were offering more in-person technical assist assistance sessions. Right. We did some of that virtually. We want to do that again mm -hmm. next year. Um, and of course, working very closely with our CLA, who is in lockstep with us on in this process and making sure that your priorities are met. So it's a combination for this particular budget recommendation or reprogramming recommendation. There isn't a formula analysis. Mm -hmm. Again, we're trying to address the immediate challenge, mm -hmm. which is not having our funds recaptured. Right. These uh, projects mm -hmm. will spend by December. Mm -hmm. So the HACLA project, um, there is going to, that timeline is very, is very quick. So we'll be able to really draw down. And again, HUD is looking at expended. They're not looking at obligated funds. So we'll be able to reduce the liability very quickly if we move forward with these recommendations. Okay. Um, thank you for that. And uh, of course, thanks to the CLA and everyone involved as well. Um, I just want to continue to uplift and, and colleagues, I just want to remind this body here on this committee, but also even as a larger council body, the responsibility and opportunity that we have to really influence uh, you know, firmly the priorities uh, with how these dollars are programmed and expended. And to think about, to think about it in a comprehensive way that leaves, um, 
greater economic mobility in our communities. And I say that with respect to economic development in particular, being an important method of, of uh, creating that independence. It's, it's, it's a balancing act that we have. It's about, you know, uh, not just feeding, but teaching how to fish. And the combination of the, it, it's about that multi-pronged approach to uplifting communities so that you don't have sustained dependence, but you actually can create the economic mobility that enables them to survive on their own to make it. And I think that's critically important and it's something that I feel that we haven't had enough emphasis on, quite frankly, that I think we need to be bolder and we need to have very grown up conversations around it when it comes to our policy making because I think that's an important part that we continue to miss. Um, you know, you don't, uh, and I could cite a Smith song about, called <laughs> Interesting Drug, but we just need to have, you know, you know, far be it for me to in include uh, music lyrics uh, in my argument, but the reality is is that we don't need, you know, dependence and codependence. What we need is, uh, is the ability to uplift and empower communities to be self-sustained. And I think that's an incredibly important component that we need to uh, talk about uh, when it comes to our policy making, that it's really, really important. And so um, I just want to uplift that and remind us all that we have that opportunity. It is a tough conversation to have, but it's an important one to have. And um, you can save more people when you teach them how to fish. And it's, you know, it's an important part of our strategy for me that I think uh, that we need to do. And we need to, have, you know, it, those conversations dovetail nicely when we have conversations about land use, when we have conversation, it's, it's multifaceted right. with how we achieve that. So uh, thank you for that. Thank, thank you. you for working with all of our respective offices. We appreciate, we know it's tough for everybody, including the city departments that are not here in these conversations right. that have to deliver and fulfill these projects. We know everyone is stretched, uh, but we appreciate the work that they do to help sustain our communities every day, and, and this is a very important part of that. So thank you. thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Rodriguez. You can quote the Smiths in this committee anytime. <laughs> thank you. Just, just FYI. Uh, <laughs> Ms. Padilla? Yes, I do have one question. Um, this report doesn't provide information on what other applications were received, uh, how they were evaluated, and their strengths or merit. So can you share any of that with us today? Or if not, could we maybe schedule a follow-up with my staff to, fig to know more about this? Yes, absolutely. And we're happy to meet and be available as many times as needed um, with you and your staff council member. And I know we had a chance to meet briefly, but we didn't get to talk about everything under our portfolio. But we did have subsequent conversations with your staff um, and happy again to meet as, as often. But the the application review process is internal. It's an internal review process for our department. Um, I can tell you, though, that the applications, the, the sorry, the projects that are being recommended did submit applications. So everything that is being recommended had a, an application. Um, in the last round of applications that we solicited, we received $300 million in requests. And uh, we don't have $300 million to make available. And so there is a very rigorous application process that the team has developed that we use for all of our project eligibility review. And it asks a series of questions about the viability, the, how viable the project is, what other financing is in place, if it's an economic development activity, it does need to be then referred to the economic development department because they have to do an underwriting process. So there is a thorough review and a Assessment. And what we did do when we had the subsequent follow-up conversations with all of the offices that were impacted is we did share that list. But that list, and we're happy to come back and um, review that again with you, there are some projects there that we could consider for future. Um, and we want to make sure that everyone is aware, and if that is of interest, that we can prioritize that as well. So you keep those on the docket? Yes, we have those. And we can, we can, we can, we can follow up with with your office at, at your request and continue that conversation. Okay, thank you. No further questions. Thank you so much, Ms. Padilla. Any other questions or comments on this item? No? Okay, let's call, uh, let's call the vote. Martinez. Yes. Council Member Hutt. Yes. Council Member Hernandez. Yes. Council Member Padilla. Yes. 
and Council Member Rodriguez. This item is approved as amended. Excellent. Uh, let's go thank to. You. Uh, thank you so much. You might. I think uh, the next one I think is you as well, uh, FSCs. So, uh, or one of someone from your team. Uh, yes. yes. Can you read item three into the record, Mr. Espinosa? Thank you. Item number three is a report from the City Administrative Officer relative to contracts with five service providers for the operation of Family Source Centers and a second amendment to a contract with El Nido uh, Family Centers to continue Family Source Center operations. Great. Thank you so much. Um, Who will be giving this report? Okay. I'm, I'm going to turn it over to our Assistant General Manager, Veronica McDonald. Good afternoon, council members. It's very nice to be here this afternoon. Um, Veronica McDonald, Assistant General Manager for the Community Investment for Families Department. And also joining us from our team um, on the far left is Matthew Sharp. He is our Assistant uh, Chief Grants Administrator. Jackie Rodriguez, uh, she is our Director of Program Operation. And we're also joined by Julie Jacoby, our uh, Chief uh, from the CAO's office. Um, this afternoon, we are here to present our recommendations for the re-procurement of the family source system. Uh, you may recall that back in December, we released an RFP for the 20 family source centers. However, we only received 15 successful proposals, and we were asked to rebid the additional five areas. Um, so we have done that, and th that's what's in the report in front of you. Um, the areas that we were rebidding were South LA, uh, Panorama City, North Hollywood, Koreatown, and Central City area. What we did to make sure that this round we had enough proposals, we did extensive outreach um, in the communities. We contacted the council offices in these districts to get a list of community-based organizations that they work closely with. We also had a team research nonprofit organizations that were in the area. We um, sent notifications, including folks that might have applied before under our community development uh, grant applications, uh, family source uh, centers, and just a network of community-based organizations that we've worked with in the past. I think what was different and unique about this time, we also included an orientation session. We wanted uh, nonprofit organizations to understand what the family source system is, what the work that we do, the, how we measure. We wanted to let them know that we are partners with them. Sometimes we know that the proposal can seem very daunting, but we wanted to make this process easy, and we wanted to know that if they were selected, we would partner with them and, hand, and provide that technical assistance along the way. We did this um, not only in person and virtually, but we did it in coffee shops. We did it, we met folks where they are and we wanted to really create this welcoming environment. So when we released the RFP in July of 2023, we did have 18 uh, nonprofit organizations that responded to the RFP. Um, of the 18, um, we did select the five, and the, air, the ones that we are recommending for approval are Genesee Center for the South LA, uh, El Centro de Amistad for Panorama City, Latino Resource Organization in North Hollywood, Central City Neighborhood Partners in Koreatown, and St. Francis in Central City. Those contracts, um, we are requesting that um, we have authority to execute with those five recommended agencies for a six-month contract beginning in January for 750000 um, also within this report, we are requesting approval to amend uh, or to create a second amendment for our family source contract with El Nido Family Source Centers. El Nido Family Source Centers provides emergency food assistance and in the 23-24 adopted budget, uh, 230000 was appropriated to provide emergency assistance in um, the Northeast San Fernando Valley. So we are recommending to uh, amend El Nido's contract to add that additional funding so that they can then enter into a subcontract with North Valley Caring Services to provide emergency food assistance that will support the solid ground program. 
um, and we're happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. McDonald. Um, I'll say a few words and then I'll, I'll pass it off to my colleagues. Um, uh, first, I want to say that uh, you know, because we've been meeting more frequently, uh, very similar to my previous comments, thank you for taking on this very challenging uh, effort. Uh, you know, seeing this number grow during the budget process uh, earlier this year, um, and seeing that uh, develop and evolve has been probably the most uh, exciting part of, of this job because you're seeing government literally be created. Uh, the funding come in, the, how that process happened, uh, people turned out and they gave a ton of public comment. Finding those uh, organizations that many of them uh, were perhaps intimidated by a I know this is 750, but it's a $1.5 million contract. And how that, what it would take to execute that and even apply for it and the hiring, and it, it just seems like so much. Um, you know, just doing it with one is a lot. I can imagine doing it with, with five, right? Uh, and then now getting to this point where we're like, hey, we got almost a finished product, it needs approval from committee. And so, all that takes a lot of work, so I want to thank you for, for that, and um, for me, to, you know, playing a more active process has been, has been really, really cool. Like, you know, there's another way to say it, right? It's been very cool to, to be a part of. And so, um, I'm sure uh, my colleagues will have some questions and comments. Uh, there's, of the three uh, new uh, FSCs, uh, uh, three of them belong to two of the council members here. So I'm sure they'll have uh, more personal comments to make about that. But uh, I just want to say, again, thank you for the work, and I'm really excited to bring these uh, online. And uh, hopefully we can improve this today. Uh, any, uh, yes, Ms. Hutt. I have a question. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, how, how's the outreach being conducted into the communities that they serve so that they know that this is, this is a service and we're here to fill in gaps? How, how, who's responsible for that? Is it the center or? Is it the department? The, it's a really, it's a partnership. So on the department side, we encourage all of our family source centers to have a grand opening. We create a press release with them. We partner during those grand openings. We have all of our centers listed on our website, but our family source centers do most of the outreach. Um, they do grassroots outreach. Not only do they participate in community events, some of them have promotora, uh, promotoras that are part of their center that do door-to-door -door outreach and connect community residents to their centers. Um, and they participate in different neighborhood councils to make sure that their community is aware. They partner with LAUSD. As you know, uh, Pupil Service Attendance and Counselor is co-located at each family source center. So they connect us to the schools that connect us to the families that live in those communities. Um, are some of the ways that we do that outreach. Thank you. Is it? All right. Mm -hmm. uh, Ms. Padilla? Uh, yes. I would like for you to outline how much a council office um, is and can be involved in giving them advice and consent to setting up a new facility to make sure that they are um, connected to service providers that have a long track record in the, in the district if it's not necessarily the one that got it. Um, because my understanding is that this money is strictly for the services, but not seed if they were to, you know, have to open up shop in the respective district that they won the grant for. So when they applied, they had to apply for a center within the boundaries of that area. So each cent there will be a center within those boundaries. And most have to identified a site. If they did not identify a site, we would then work with them. If there is a, a site in, for example, in your council district that you wanted the organization to look at that maybe was not um, one that they proposed, and if they don't have a facility, we can see if it meets the needs of the Family Source Center. Generally, the Family Source Centers require a, approximately 5,000 square feet in order to provide all of the different array of services that are offered. Um, we did recently meet with El Centro de Amistad, um, and they talked about their location and trying to find sites. They did 
mentioned that they met with your staff. Yes. Um, regarding I would like to place them in a facility um, that is owned but not being fully occupied or programmed out by Rec and Parks. So would you help to facilitate with our office uh, potentially getting them into that underutilized space? Yes, so um, what we've done is we do have to approve the recommendations before we can continue to engage in more longer term planning, but absolutely our department has in many occasions help to convene those conversations that can extend beyond our department, Rec and Parks, other departments in your office. Council members do absolutely influence. You want to set the vision for the work of the family source provider in your district, identify opportunities to collaborate, talk about what are your priorities, of what you want to see, what are some of the gaps that you're seeing in your district that, that you want them to be responsive to within, of course, the scope of the family source program design. So again, with this model, we're here to also partner to make sure that they are ensuring that they're delivering all of the critical services to your constituents and that if they need additional support from us, that's where we also step in and provide that support. We're very intentional partners with all of the relationships that we ask them to leverage, we help facilitate. So not just with your, with council offices, but with the school district, with the county systems, we bring those conversations to the table to help broker those conversations. Okay, thank you. Also, as we advise on locations in the district that would benefit from an FSC, is it possible to operate for multiple locations um, under this one contract? And what are your best practices for doing so? So we have some FSCs that have two locations. <clears throat> Most only have one, but there are sites that have a satellite. Um, I think where it becomes a hardship for the organization is on the funding level, if they could support in those, um, both of those offices. Because there's sometimes not only staffing, but also overhead costs. Okay, thank you. And then my last question is uh, renter's rights and wage theft assistance is an enormous issue in our district. How can the FSC model work to address this and provide assistance uh, to its residents? So for, you mean clients that might experience wage theft? Correct, so in the case management um, opportunity that these FSCs take on for the clients, these are two uh, things that tend to come up, renter's rights, and wage theft. Um, I'm curious if there's a requirement or a way to kind of encourage them or support them to build out the partnerships or seek the funding for those two. Because one thing that I know from a client perspective, you come into these locations, FSC, you know, and um, every different organization that is getting an FSC grant, you know, none of them are identical. Everybody uh, has a different expertise, but we do know that across the board in the city, in this council, right, we're always talking about what is the future of supporting renters and also how do we address the ills of wage theft. So I'm curious what you're, you're doing or what can be done to bring uh, the opportunity to help the, the clients that do go through the process of considering themselves an FSC client to also be supported in these two with these two issue capacities. Okay. So we do support um, renter's rights as part of our solid ground um, work that we're doing within the family source system. We want to stabilize housing. We want families to know their rights. Some FSCs do that directly. Some of them partner with organizations. In the past, we've partnered with the housing department. Um, they have done training for family source centers on renters' rights, they've connected them. Recently, we had another training. There's online resources. They help support tenants if they do get, receive a three-day notice to pay or quit. Um, what do they need to do? Filing um, the proper paperwork. They will assist them with those pieces. Wage theft, we haven't done a lot, but it doesn't mean that it's not something that the Family Source Center cannot assist or connect them to resources. 
because that's really the design of the Family Source Center. It's a really no wrong door approach. Come in, let us assess what your needs are, and then we are gonna provide those services directly or connect you. And each Family Source Center makes sure that they do that in, with a warm handoff. We don't want just to refer someone than to be referred to somewhere else. And we really try to build that resource for each of the agencies. We meet monthly with the agencies where they share best practices and what they, what works in their district. Um, and then we also have presentations for them on an ongoing basis to provide that training. We not only do it with the directors for the Family Source Centers, but we also have regular case management meetings with all of the different providers. And that case management meeting is every single FSC as case manager staff that we're providing the training so that they also are hearing the information, they're able to ask questions, they're able to share what challenges they are seeing on the ground so that we can then help support and provide whatever technical assistance they might need. Okay, that's, thank you for that answer. Um, I, I guess it's just kind of uh, making me think outside the box of what could potentially happen because I know that within this committee, we've been reported on how the way that we fund, you know, s the reduction of wage theft in this city has been more by industry, right? So we've been supporting, you know, people that uh, are experiencing wage theft because they're in the restaurant or because they work in car wash. But I'm curious if uh, maybe we could do more to enhance the partnership so that if you happen to be a client and you, uh, you know, you you're working in the restaurant or you're experiencing it through working at a car wash, we can let them know that there is city funded resources to yeah. be supported in that. And then, and, you know, at the same time, build that the relationship with the organizations that are experts in this, not just necessarily by, by occupation, but wage theft in general. Yes, absolutely. And we also partner with other systems. So we partner with the work source centers, we partner with the youth source centers. So we do partner with a host of other systems that are similar to family source. But I, I love the idea of exploring because, you know, we can almost guarantee that the population that we serve across the system are um, being, um, are victims of, of wage, wage theft, if you will. So I do think that there is a lot of opportunity to have very tailored strategies for um, these different subgroups. But in general, we also connect people to immigrate, um, not just immigration, but also to legal ser services if they need to. So that is a component of the family source system as well. No further questions. Thank you so much, Councilmember Padilla. Uh, Councilmember Hyde, may I have another follow-up? I'm sorry, one more question. No, I'd be sorry, you're good. So I see that this is a six-month term. At what month do you start evaluating if they have the capacity to carry on the next six months? And then do they have to reapply through RFP process, you know, for an additional year, or is it six months? No, they do not need to reapply. Um, so this will be a six-month contract, and then we have authority to ex um, execute another contract with them um, for up to two years, additional two years. So, and then the way we evaluate them, we really are proactive. Um, we do that monthly with the agencies. We have a scorecard where we have all of our goals and indicators that we are expecting them to achieve. And we re share that with the executive directors on a monthly basis at our meetings. This way they can see where they're at. We also look at it and if an agency is not performing in an area, we meet with them and we also off offer technical assistance. What challenges are you experiencing? How can we help support? What technical assistance or guidance you might need? Um, so there's that as well. And then the contract is being evaluated by a third party evaluator. We have contracted this year with CSUN, uh, Cal uh, California State University Northridge, to do an evaluation on the family source system. Um, and so that will be independent of our scorecard. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Ms. Hyatt. Any other questions, comments? No? All right, let's call the vote on this item. Thank you, Councilmember Soto Martinez. Yes. Councilmember Hutt? Aye. Councilmember Hernandez? Yes. Councilmember Padilla? Yes. And Councilmember Rodriguez? Aye. This item is approved. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for your work again. Thank you. Thank entire, you. Uh, Thank you all. Here at this table. Yeah. Thank you. Do you have any other items, Mr. Spinoza? No, the desk is clear. Excellent.
Happy Friday, everyone. Have a good one. Be safe. Wonderful weekend. Thank you all so much.